fellow Rotarians and guests, this week's program is another riveting life story. It's a success story of individuals who've overcome seemingly insurmountable odds with patience, perseverance, and endurance to try in the face of adversity. This week, the adversary is quite a illness. I'd like to bring to your attention that the month of March is National Kidney Month, and there are a few things you should know about kidney disease. Kidney disease often has no symptoms until the late stages of the disease. Diabetes and high blood pressure are leading causes of kidney failure. As many as 31 million Americans are living with chronic illness disease, and it's the ninth leading cause of death in the United States. Today, over 90,000 people in the U.S. are waiting for kidney transplant. Our presenters today, John and Maria Pauly, share their personal transplantation journey that began when Maria was diagnosed with adult type 1 diabetes in her mid-20s. Approximately 10 years later, in 2001, Maria developed eclampsia during her second pregnancy which resulted in her being the uh, son being delivered 10 weeks early. Both Maria and her son were admitted to the intensive care unit. While their son's quality of life improved over the next several years, Maria's health deteriorated, with both kidneys eventually failing. In September of 2008, Maria received a double organ transplant consisting of a new kidney and a new pancreas. The operation was initially successful, however, in early 2007, the transplanted kidney was lost due to complications. The pancreas did take, allowing Maria to no longer be a type 1 diabetic. In late 2008, she began dialysis treatments after an awkward and unsuccessful letter writing campaign asking family and friends to donate a kidney to her. At this point, her only option was to be placed on the national transplant list for a cadaver kidney. The wait time to get another kidney was over seven years. And one evening, her husband John was watching a public broadcast show on kidney chains recently done at John Hopkins Medical Center. John and Maria did apply to be a candidate for a turn down. Frustrated, John went back to Maria's transplant team at Pinnacle Hospital, begged them to consider doing their first kidney transplant chain with them. In October of 2009, after 15 months of coordination, planning, and testing, Maria successfully received and John successfully donated a kidney from and to total strangers from across the United States via the National Kidney Registry. The chain included 10 donors and 10 recipients, and the story was highlighted on CBS News with Katie Kirk. In November of last year, John and Maria spoke of their journey in San Diego at the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists. And the title of their talk is Take One, Leave One, A Family Experience of Kidney Transplants. It's my pleasure to welcome and introduce John and Maria Pollard, who reside and Dallas Castle for two sons. Transplantation journey. 
journey with all of you. My story began in my early 20s when I was suddenly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. As you can imagine, this was devastating to me and my family. My life literally changed overnight. I went from being able to eat and drink anything that I wanted to having to watch everything I ate and drank, checking blood sugars, and injecting insulin four times a day. It was very hard adjusting to this new lifestyle and difficult to get my blood sugars under control. One of the most unfortunate things about this disease is not, realize, is not realizing all the unseen long-term damage it does internally. In my early 30s, I was fortunate to meet, fall in love with, and marry John Pollock. John and I had our two boys within 15 months of each other. I had our first son, Nicholas, when I was 33. Everything with my pregnancy went very well. My A1C was six. I carried him to term. And we had a healthy eight pound, 11 ounce baby boy. We were very happy and knew we wanted at least one more child. Since things went so smoothly with Nicholas, and we were in our 30s, we decided to have our second child by the way. Unfortunately, my second pregnancy did not go as well as my first one did. I did not feel good and struggled with my blood sugars and blood pressure. Um, ultimately, I developed preeclampsia, and Adam had to be delivered 10 weeks early. He was only three pounds, 13 ounces, and 16 inches long. He was in the NICU for six weeks. He was very strong and determined, and today is almost as big as his older brother and a straight A student. I, however, did not do well after the delivery. The eclampsia did not go away. My blood started, my body started shutting down, and I ended up in the ICU. They eventually got me stabilized, and I was released. We struggled with my health for over a year before I finally went to see Dr. Mohan, some of you may know him, um, a nephrologist who diagnosed me with kidney disease. At this point, he referred me to Dr. Harold Yang, which is at Pinnacle Hospital, um, at Central Transportation Services. Dr. Yang placed me on the kidney pancreas transplant list. Finally, in September of 2006, after the holiday weekend, I received a call late in the evening saying that they had a cadaver match for me. It was very exciting, and at the same time, my husband John and I were very nervous. Shortly after being admitted, John and I had an unexpected challenge with our health insurance company. They said they would not cover the surgery because we did not have pre-approval. John struggled with the insurance company for two days while I lay waiting in the hospital. You can only imagine what was going through our minds after years of struggling and waiting for that life-changing phone call, and here we are, wasting precious time arguing with the insurance company. We finally worked things out, and on September 3rd, 2006, I received my kidney pancreas transplant. I do not remember the first few days immediately following the surgery, but I clearly remember from that point on. What a struggle. Not only for me, but for my family too. Let's just say that I have not been a normal patient. I spent a few more days in the hospital with the normal trans transplant patients and certainly was not feeling like I thought I would be when it was finally time to go home. And before going home, imagine getting lessons, lessons, on your medications. John and I went home with a notebook of instructions, a chart showing us pictures of all the medications, and a bag of meds. I thought giving my, myself injections was bad and challenging. Try taking 40 pills in the morning and between 28 and 30 in the evening every day. This was my life now. Remember I said I was not feeling as good as I thought I would be when I left the hospital. It turns out that I was bleeding internally. I had been home for about a week and kept feeling worse instead of feeling better. 
It took everything I had to get from the sofa to the table to eat. Finally, my lab showed that my blood counts were extremely low. I was rushed back to the hospital and given six pints of blood. They came down to the conclusion that there was bleeding from the pancreas, which disrupted the flow to the kidney, and that my kidney transplant would slowly fail. Amazingly, the pancreas took, and I at least was no longer diabetic. Unfortunately, I continued to have complications and was in and out of the hospital for months. This was extremely difficult for John and our children. I would tell them I was going for a checkup at the doctors, and they would end up admitting me, and I would not come home for days, sometimes weeks. Anemia and blood clots were just a few of the challenges. One particular instance, which really resonates with my family, was that two days before our son Nicholas's birthday, whoever would have thought that being pricked by a pyracanthia bush while hanging up Christmas lights would lead to a blood infection and in weaken the hospital and missing my son's birthday. Needless to say, Nicholas will never forget. It was very hard for him. He hated seeing me in the hospital and to this day worries and gets very upset when I'm not feeling well. As Dr. Hankin told me it would, I lost my new kidney in early 2007. This was an even harder challenge for John the boys and, and for me. At that time, we were told I would have about a seven year wait for another kidney. In October 2008, I started dialysis. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I would spend my entire morning into the early afternoon at the dialysis unit here in York. Initially, I felt pretty good, but eventually it caught up to me and I would be totally worn out after treatment into the following morning. I would have a decent day off, but it would start all over again the next day. This was extremely hard for John. Not only was he running our family school bus business, he was now doing most of the work with the boys and trying to help me when he could. As I said, dialysis was a very difficult challenge for me and my family. It affected our ability to travel and to do many things. I now had to come home from dialysis or make for dialysis or make arrangements to be dialyzed at another unit while we were away. So our travel was pretty much limited to our beach house during the summer, and that was about it. Dialysis was extremely hard on my body. I lost a tremendous amount of weight. I went from 130 pounds to a low of about 98 pounds. I was very weak and I could not fight off much of anything. I had several infections where they would end up admitting me to the hospital for IV antibiotics and end up moving my catheter in my neck from one side to the other. One particular instance, John was away on business and I became extremely ill one night. The next morning I told the boys they had to go to the neighbor and she would take them to the bus stop. I called for an ambulance to take me to the hospital. Unfortunately, the boys were standing at the bus stop and saw the ambulance pick me up and take me away. Imagine how frightening that is for a first and third grader. My health was declining rapidly. I did not do well with dialysis. I was getting weaker and becoming ill more often. At this time, John and I made the difficult decision to write a letter to our family members and our closest friends asking if anyone would consider becoming a living donor for me. This was a very difficult thing to do, but John was not a match for me, and seven years was such a long time. I honestly feel I would not have made it that long. John and I have always been fans of PBS. Imagine how we felt turning on PBS one Sunday evening and seeing the program about pair kidney exchanges which were being done internally at the John Hopkins Hospital, which is just over an hour from us. It was like we were meant to see this program. So I contacted John Hopkins immediately and I completed the 
the application to, partic to participate in their paired kidney exchange program. Our insurance carrier, United Healthcare, was one of the nation's largest health insurance companies, was not accepted by John Hopkins. Therefore, we were turned down. We were devastated. Frustrated, I called Dr. Yang at Pinnacle Health and explained that I had, what I had seen on the PBS. I wanted Pinnacle to participate in a paired exchange program and I would volunteer. After about a year of screenings, I was medically qualified and was asked to participate in a small paired kidney exchange at the University of Pennsylvania. I was excited that we could finally get rid of a new kidney. Unfortunately, due to the poor, the poor health of one of the people in the chain, this exchange was canceled. Frustrated, we began to wait again. In 2009, Pinnacle began to work with the National Kidney Registry. Marie and I were asked to be part of one of the first large national care kidney exchanges. On October 1, 2009, 20 strangers came together, 10 donors and 10 recipients, to improve the quality of each other's lives. My kidney went to Simeon, a professor in California, whose donor was part of a 15-person chain through California, eventually ending up with Tanya, who donated a kidney to Maria on behalf of a retired New York lawyer. I don't mind if I do that for a lawyer, but we'll talk about it. <laughs> Sorry, Ron <Roger. laughs> Needless to say, words cannot describe our gratitude to the people, doctors, nurses, and the National Kidney Registry. We were told that after the exchange, all 20 people were doing well. Our story, our story was shared nationally on the CBS Evening News with Katie Kirk. I wanted to share my experience as a donor so that I may encourage some of you to consider doing the same. My surgery began on Wednesday at 5.30 a.m. I was awake and back at my room by 9.30 a.m. By 10, I had eaten and by noon I was out of bed. That evening, I was able to walk to see Maria who had gotten her transplant later that day. After three days, I left the hospital on a Saturday to watch my son's football game. I've had no side effects except, of course, one less kidney. If you look at the person to your left and then to your right, these are the faces of what a donor looks like. Everyday people willing to do a great act of kindness. It was one of the most rewarding things I could have done for another person especially for my wife. I need to take a minute and address an untrue rumor, though. For those of you who know me, know that I am a twin. I did not yell, really, my name is Joe, that's my twin brother's name, when I, they wheeled me into the operating room. <laughs> I will be the first to tell you that I still have many challenges. I found out early last year that my transplanted pancreas is no longer producing enough insulin, so I'm now considered a type 2 diabetic. I need to do insulin injections again and am back to monitoring my blood sugars and trying to keep them under control. Due to the long-term effects of several of my anti-rejection medications, I now have osteoporosis. I broke my hip and fractured my femur by simply falling over on my bike. Recently, I've had multiple stress fractures in my feet from simply walking, and I had a mini stroke, which caused me to lose 50% of the vision in my right eye, just to name some of the more significant things. On a more positive note, and a much brighter side of things, my transplanted kidney is still functioning, and I'm hoping it will do so for a very long time. Being able to receive a kidney by being on the National Kidney Registry is truly amazing. Due to the effort and willingness of my wonderful doctor, Dr. Harold Yang, to be one of the first doctors to participate in the registry exchange, by my awesome husband for being willing to donate his kidney so that I could receive a kidney, and of course, the wonderful woman, Tanya Nye, who I now call my kidney sister, whose kidney is working inside me today. Tanya and I still keep in touch, and I hope we always will. Thanks to her, the amazing doctors, and the support of our wonderful family and friends, many of whom are here today, which, by the way, we love you all very much, we are able to do things we had only hoped of doing before. We're taking total advantage of this time we now have by taking our boys all over the world. We've been to Spain, Italy, France, 
South Africa, Greece, and Turkey, just to name a few, and are headed to Peru, the Amazon, and the Galapagos Islands this summer. Our journey is far from over. Bruce Living donated Kimmy is healthy with a life expectancy of about 20 years. This means that when Maria is in her mid 60s, she will most likely need a new kidney. It would be a hope that at some point she could have a kidney grown specifically for her. We saw examples of several stem cell grown organs, such as a bladder, on our recent trip to the Worldwide Conference of the American Academy of Pharmaceutical Science in California this past fall. The research these scientists are doing is amazing. It will be life-changing for people like Maria and you. We are honored to have been able to share our story with all of you. We ask you to keep in your prayers Lisa and John Bloom of York, who have found themselves at the very beginning of a similar journey with the Nicole and Dr. Gang. Thank you very much. <laughs>